in the majesty of its mountains, in the grace of its falls, in the diversity of its forests, wetlands, and plant and animal life, The northern Catskill region of upstate New York is one of the great natural wonders of the world. You can read an ancient glacial story imprinted into its Devonian stone. You can feel the wonder that inspired the great Hudson River School painters and conservationists. Not just in the grand panoramas, but in the dappled details of a sunlit stand of ferns, the bark of a tree, or the bud of a flower. You can also see signs of fragility, not only in the face of modern-day development, but in the way the forests were clear-cut more than a hundred years ago. The Mountaintop Arboretum was founded in 1977 by Dr. Peter Ahrens and his wife Bonnie as a scientific station to study trees that could withstand the rigorous climate of the 2,400-foot elevation. It would soon evolve into a center for environmental education and family recreation. Programs and lectures became so popular that the seasonal structure that housed them became inadequate to the task. Sometimes the art of conservation involves knowing what to discard and what to build anew. A new education center and maintenance barn needed to blend seamlessly with the natural surroundings and at the same time meet the challenges of an expanding audience, especially outside the summer season. But how? Timberframe architect Jack Soban came up with the answer. The building would be made of trees from the surrounding woods and stone from the basement excavation, and it would be handcrafted by the skill of local artisans. In short, the building would be made of everything the Mountaintop Arboretum honors. This building will be an introduction to the Arboretum. I like the idea of a magical building, something that has sort of a storybook character to it. There's plenty of boring, architecture out there that does not inspire people. So what we envision here is something that is an interesting, fascinating building on its own. It's a showpiece for a sustainable building as well. The Arboretum decided to first build the carriage barn, partly as proof of concept, but also to better understand the process of timber framing. Then we gotta find all these guys here. You know, Though timber framing has been around for centuries, there are few craftsmen left who are experts in the field. The process began by searching the property for the right trees. In the end, beams, posts, pins, siding, and floors would be crafted from 21 species. I manage forests. I try to protect, preserve, and increase new growth as much as possible, but still have use of it. In the autumn, the forest floor is at its most fragile state. Removing logs with mechanized equipment can be damaging. An innovative, if slightly retro, solution was found. More horsepower. A team of Belgian draft horses, to be precise. The Arboretum wanted to do low impact. 
that's why we're pretty much doing things old school. By next spring, other than the stumps and the sticks that are left, you won't even know that we were here doing what we were doing. So we do as little damage to the ground, surrounding trees, plants, everything. Timber framing was once the method of construction in forested countries around the world. And it was what was brought to America and was used primarily up till about the 1840s or 50s or so when stud framing was developed. And stud framing came in because it, they needed to build towns and cities quickly as they were pushing west in this rush, this industrial revolution rush. We've thrown away some really great things it still made sense today. In the late 60s, early 70s, a lot of people saw this. Timber framing was revived. And there's a healthy population of timber framers today building beautiful structures. It's still not mainstream, but it's made a, a big comeback and it's very popular. After selecting and cutting down the trees, the wood is sent to a sawmill to be cut and shaped. Timber framing is a really organic process. It's strong, it's durable. Our stick frame buildings now are designed to maybe last half of a lifetime, where these buildings last generations. You can look at a timber frame building and understand why that building actually works and stands. They're just pure form of building. They don't lie. There's no secrets. It's all right there. It's not hidden behind layers of plaster or what have you, it's, it's there to see. There is beauty in the simplicity of it. When all the lumber is ready, it's transported back to the Arboretum for construction. The barn becomes the first test timber frame building. Timber framing is a craft of joining timbers together through mortise and tenons or lapped and dovetail joinery. And it's pegged and held in place with wooden pegs. You'll know right away if the building is put together right. Everything sits well, everything's in its place. There is no hidden secrets in timber framing. You can't hide poor work. What you see is what you get. It speaks for itself. With the carriage barn completed, the Arboretum began the much more difficult task of constructing the main building, the Education Center. Because some species need to be cut in winter, Jack and his team had to wait until the first snow fell on the Arboretum. One of the, the goals of the project was to make a building that was eco-friendly and lives lightly on the land and does its part to help the environment. So we have permission to take trees on either side of the road. Um, I forgot to show you, there's three small striped maples in there. We can we look saw at those. on the way out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Too small. You don't really know exactly where the design is going until you looked at the forest. 
And that's the first thing we did, was walk through some of the woods here. Like that one over there looks better. See the one on the other side of the fence there? Yeah. I, mean, I can't tell if it's flat yeah. in the other direction, but you see the top. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, that's part of our study. Okay, well that, that's the type of tree we're looking for. Just the one crotch, so it's gonna be nice and strong. All right, let's keep moving. Let's get into the woods where we yeah. have free reign. I try to keep an open mind on the timber. So when I come to look at a given property, the property may have a lot of stunted, crooked trees or may have tall, straight specimens. I try to work with what they have. And that's the fun part of this. All right, so there's 14 feet. Well, how tall do you want to go? So what do we need for rafters? 18. 18, so you get back a little ways and eyeball up. You get one rafter. But you have. Yeah, you get one rafter because it's only big enough for one up there. No. Hey, by the way, beach can look like crap on the outside and be perfectly fine inside. You want that one? So most people see trees standing with leaves on them. They don't see the wood and they don't connect the two. Looks like a good crotch to me. Want to mark that? Where's our mark? Yes. We tried to use a little bit of everything here, although we could have picked just one species, I guess, and used it throughout. If you want to be lightly on the landscape and, and be good to the forest, you pick a mixture of trees because that's what the forest is. You know, we have 20 something species in the forest. If you just pick one, you're going to change the makeup of the forest. And that's what a lot of commercial logging operations do. They just go and pick out sort of the cream out of the forest. So we want to go in there and we want to take a little bit of everything sort of in the same proportion that is in the forest and use that in the building. So we haven't changed the makeup of the forest. In winter, with a frozen forest floor, tractors could do the clearing cleanly enough. Wood itself is a great carbon sink. The trees are storing up carbon throughout their entire lifetime. And when you harvest the trees and you use it inside a building where it doesn't decay or doesn't burn, that will live on, then it's, that carbon remains stored in the wood. Back at the timber mill, the artisans continue the exacting craft of preparing the wood for the elegantly designed, but more complex, education center. We hand selected, I believe it's 21 different species from the forest. They were sawn up on a bandsaw mill, on a custom sawmill that can saw extra long timbers. And then the first thing we do is plane everything down. Generally, that's kind of the mundane, boring, tedious part. But it's actually really kind of fun and exciting in, in this frame because they're all different species. And so, you know, kind of everything's a little surprise, you know. Everything works a little bit differently and you get to, you know, get a feel for how everything looks, which adds something special to this project. Traditionally in timber framing, horse and tenon joints are held together with a wooden pin, like this. It was called a pin traditionally. Nowadays we call these pegs. They're driven through a pinhole in the tenon and the mortise, which pulls the joint together. Now, common sense would say you put the joint together as tight as possible, and then you drill a hole right through. Seems like a no-brainer, right? But that's not the way it was done, and it's not the proper way to do it. Because as soon as the wood dries and shrinks, or as soon as you rack the frame, putting it up a little bit, you get a gap, and then it gets wider as it dries and shrinks, until eventually it's unsightly and it's not structurally sound. So they use a technique called draw boring, 
or draw pinning, where the holes are offset from the mortise and the tenon by, in this case, about an eighth of an inch. So when you put the joint together and look down through, the holes aren't quite lined up. The hole on the tenon is a little bit closer to the axis of the piece. So when you drive a tapered pin through those offset holes, it sucks up the joint tight. And it actually puts a bend in this peg, which keeps it tight as the timber dries. So it's just a superior way of doing this. This is a little different from a normal timber frame because it has to be scribed. By scribing, it means each joint is custom made it and is not interchangeable. It's a time consuming process and involves a lot of leveling and squaring and assembly and disassembly. It can take twice as long as a conventional timber frame. But the beauty of this system is it allows you to use curved pieces, organic shapes, crotches, whatever the timber is, wainy pieces, you know, pieces with rounded edges on them. If you didn't scribe these pieces, it would be a very clunky fit. But this allows a very smooth junction between the pieces. They look like they almost grew together. Finally, after three years of work, the education center is ready to be raised. People are, are starving for real things, something that has a little bit of background, some history to it, that uses natural products rather than artificial things. And then when you see animals pulling your logs out of the woods in the snow and, and you see people raising up a building with their hands, you can't put a price on that. It could be the same building when it's finished, perhaps, just looking at it. But the fact that you saw all that went into it makes it much more special in your mind. Because the people were part of that, the local forest was part of that. It just means so much more when it's done that way. Typically in conventional framing, you do have a little movement in the wood, but the movement on the materials are very minimal. The timber frame is all cut when it's all green. It's not sitting out to dry. So as we're building, the building is always moving. You take a tree, you cut it, it looks square, it looks good, but then you put your level on it and it can be way out, quarter inch, three eighths of an inch. That's a lot in building. You get to a point where you just work with it. You go along with it because you can't control wood that moves and shrinks and twists and cracks. So you got to make it look good. You don't necessarily have to make it level. My inspiration is the forests. And I try to bring that environment into the building as much as I can. I think we're oftentimes separated from the natural environment in our buildings. So whenever you can make a building that's more natural, which brings in natural light and fresh air from the outside, and uses natural materials that are healthier for us, materials we've, we've been surviving with for thousands of years, stone, timber, earth. Doing things in, in as much a natural way as possible. A building like this could easily last many generations. We've seen buildings hundreds of years old, timber framed across the country. It's gonna be really neat to see our kids and then our grandkids and even their kids enjoy this building. It's very special to the whole community. 
So much of what is built today does not last. You know, we see that all the time. We see buildings that are put up quickly and cheaply and, and fill some sort of a, a need in the economy. And it, it really says something about working with timber and wood. With all that we have today, with lasers and CAD and all this stuff, although you can do things quicker, faster, more efficiently perhaps, it doesn't come out the same. They say that it's hard to improve upon nature, the forms, the curves, the shapes. It's extremely difficult for modern industrial operations to create really attractive shapes. So why try to improve upon that? Just use those curves from nature. Accent them in the building and uh, try to just focus on and it's its own beauty. And rather than just sawing up trees and making perfect square, crisp edged components, you've taken and, and left the round parts, the curves, the crotches, left the character of the tree. There'll be thousands of visitors going through this building and seeing what organic timber framing is, seeing how we can use our, our native trees and the stone. We want to be able to go in there and to, to see more than just walls and a ceiling. We want them to see what forests can do, what architecture is like, what, what good eco-friendly architecture is like, what warm, honest building systems are like. That's what you're trying to portray in here. We brought the forest inside the building. <laughs>